My name is Taryn Hart, and I'm with Occupied Media, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. And I'm Jared Bernstein. I'm an economist in Washington, D.C. I formerly worked uh, for the uh, Obama administration from December 2008 until May of 2011. Great. And what are you working on? Re the most recent thing I remember seeing is you were working on... Um, you had a fast ah, program. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I have a blog, uh, jaredbornsteinblog.com, where I right. try to talk about everything I'm working on. Uh, you're thinking of this program that myself and a couple of colleagues were working on, uh, a jobs program, kind of in the spirit of Keynesian stimulus, Fix America's Schools Today or Fast. Uh, this is an infrastructure program designed at repair and modernization of the 100,000 public schools across the nation, which face a very deep repair backlog because uh, towns and localities, cities are uh, especially crunched right now in budget terms. You know, they can't run right. deficits like the federal government does. Right. So they've been, they've, they've got a big backlog in the repairs. Obviously, there are a ton of people who need those kinds of jobs, so we thought it was a, a nice idea to try to marry the two. Uh, right. By the way, that, that idea did end up in the president's uh, jobs plan, uh, which okay. is a good thing. Yeah, but of course that's been blocked uh, uh, by Republicans. Right. I know. I remember uh, Jan Schakowsky. If I'm, mm -hmm. yeah, I, she picked it up, and then it ended up in the president's plan. So it's not. So it's not um, completely dead. There's still maybe hope, or is it dead? No, no. There's actually hope from an interesting quarter, but it's a funny kind of hope. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the Republicans initially said they, they didn't like it. They didn't want to do any infrastructure. And we can talk, by the way, I think there's some uh, deeper reasons why Republicans have been so adamantly against uh, any more stimulus. And I should say, it's not all Republicans. There's a couple of Democrats in the Senate voted against the, uh, the jobs plan as well. Uh, but uh, but uh, recently, Senators Warner and Webb, um, uh, my two senators, I'm talking to you from Virginia, mm. put forth a version of this fast, Fix America Schools Today idea. Um, and surprisingly, it was endorsed by Eric Cantor, um, which uh, means perhaps it does have some legs. Now, this is a very scaled down version of the program. Uh, but what it does is in, instead of a, a simple grant to localities to repair, modernize, make energy efficient uh, their schools. This works through the National Historic Preservation List. There's buildings across the country that are on this list, and you can get a tax credit to uh, to repair or modernize them. But no one seems to know how many schools are on that list. Uh, we think it may be in the hundreds. There's 100,000 public schools across this nation. Almost all of them could use some help. So it's, it's very, very scaled down. But look, frankly, these days, Tara, I'm happy to get my nose under any tent Anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been I've been watching. I think it's a great program, and I think it would it's a travesty if it doesn't pass. I think it's a no brainer, frankly, um, that the schools need the help, that we need the stimulus. It just makes sense, and this is and so it's specifically designed, I should mention, to be exactly what a stimulus plan should be, which is to have you know that that they aren't long term, that it's quick. And we'll get money into the economy quickly, create jobs quickly, right? I mean, you specifically designed it for that. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's right. I mean, it, it, again, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a program that has a backlog, so it sort of has that shovel-ready characteristic that we're mm -hmm. looking for. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Well, I guess I just wanted to start with um, what you think the diagnosis of our economy is, what's wrong with our economy, um, and then we'll get to how you think we should fix it. <laughs> okay, uh, diagnosis, prescription. That sounds mm -hmm. like a good way to go. Mm -hmm. um, well, we've already actually kind of alluded to what's wrong with the economy in the short term, which is uh, the absence of, uh, of enough demand, which really is kind of a, uh, the way economists talk about customers walking into stores, um, uh, inventory that needs back orders, um, uh, projects that uh, investors can invest in and <clears throat> and uh, and get a return. As long as there's really no, uh, as long as private sector demand is as weak as it's been, 
uh, there's a, a, a short-term role, and as you mentioned, temporary is important, uh, for fiscal stimulus. And, and, and for various reasons, political and otherwise, that's, that's blocked right now. But I actually think that, that you and Occupy Wall Street in particular are not just talking about the short term and the, right. the, you know, the absence of, uh, uh, this kind of temporary demand situation. Because actually, the, the, over the longer term, um, many of the problems that we're beset with today have been evolving. It's not like the economy was doing great in the expansion of the 2000s and it hit the recession and everything, uh, uh, you know, uh, went, went downhill. Uh, middle class families, poor families, uh, for really, uh, one of the first expansions in the history of the data going back to the 1940s, they, they got nowhere in the 2000s expansion. As the economy was growing, the income of middle class families was flat, even falling. Poverty went up in those years. And of course, if the economy is growing and most families are just treading water, the growth has to be going somewhere. Right. And uh, there you run right into the inequality uh, problem, which has been evolving over 20, 30 years. That's another thing that's wrong with, with, with the economy. Uh, so uh, I would argue that uh, we've had, we have a, a short-term uh, cyclical demand problem, but a longer-term structural po- problem. That has to do with inequality. It has to do with uh, weak job creation. And it has to do with uh, deep instability in key markets like financial markets. So you've got this, well, I call it the shampoo cycle, bubble, bust, repeat. You, you've had this, <laughs> you've had this shampoo economy working for, for, for decades now. Meanwhile, um, we've, uh, uh, um, pursued a kind of a fiscal recklessness. So we're, we're dealing with, uh, debt and deficit problems, uh, in a structural sense as well. So, Basically, in cyclical and in structural terms, meaning in short term and long term, uh, the the diagnosis is uh, is um, uh, as I've said, uh, either ignoring these issues by policymakers or enacting things like the Bush tax cuts that make them worse. Yeah, I, I and I I think you're exactly right in terms of our movement is concerned with all, as you know, there's obviously the short term problem, which is massive joblessness, also. Um, and this is, and some people think this is related to the, to our demand issue, but I actually spoke with Dean Baker recently who didn't, and I was really surprised, but the debt problem, and debt is a huge issue for a lot of the people associated with our movement, student debt in particular, which actually economists haven't talked about as much as mortgage debt in terms of, you know, the, um, I'll get to it when we talk about solutions a little bit more, but a lot of economists have mentioned mortgage restructuring, but not as many, for whatever reason, have mentioned student loan, debt forgiveness, um, these types of things, not in terms at least of uh, dealing with demand. You know, I think people have tied the mortgage debt more um, to the demand well, I issue. Think, I think the demand connection for any kind of debt you're talking about uh, is connected through unemployment, through jobs, and through income. Uh, one of the things we've recognized is that, uh, and this is not rocket science by any stretch of the imagination, right. but um, wh- where you've got high unemployment, uh, you've got uh, more people going underwater in their mortgages and, and right. facing um, facing foreclosure or at least uh, delinquent uh, on their on their on their loans, and. Uh, it's the same thing for students who um, uh, get out of school burdened by loans, mm-hmm. unable to get either a job or a job that it, uh, provides them with the income they need to adequately service the loan. And I actually thought the president's idea that he put forth the other day, it's, actually, it's something we worked on when I was at the White House. Uh, at, at the, I, I was the uh, uh, executive director of the White House Task Force on the Middle Class. And um, mm-hmm. one of the things we worked on was this, income-based repayment idea. And uh, the, the idea was that if you had a, a, a loan that was guaranteed or backed by, by the government, uh, you could uh, um, pay back uh, no more than 10%. You, you, your payments could be reduced uh, to be no more than 10% of your income. Uh, and uh, you know, that, that's, that's uh, I think, a helpful way to enable people to service that debt, even in a, even in a tough economy. 
So, yeah. So, okay. So there's, there's, of course, you know, the jobs crisis, which is, you know, I, I, you had referred me to Larry Mitchell, who's fantastic, and had just recently done something um, showing the devastating effects of long-term mass unemployment, that it affects not only the people who are unemployed, but in fact the, un the employed, and affects us for decades to come. I mean, the, it's just unbelievably devastating what this kind of long-term mass unemployment does. It really should be a crisis. Everybody should really be you know, all hands on deck, this should be an emergency, I mean, it's an absolutely devastating thing. So there's that, and then also I think, you know, a lot of people um, associated with our movement are concerned that even before the crash, the system was unable to, and whether this is political or economic, um, unable to address the environment, unable to address health care, mm -hmm. unable to tackle the types of issues that frankly are critical and are you know uh, I, I look go ahead. Uh, let me let me jump in there because yeah. I it, what you're saying really really resonates um, and, and 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 I like the way you put it because frankly I I weight every one of those equally heavily um, you're you're absolutely right that unemployment uh, long-term unemployment the fact that so many of the unemployed have been stuck there for such a long time, uh, isn't just a problem for the period that you're unemployed, especially if you're a young person, it can reverberate throughout your career. Your whole trajectory of earnings and income can, can be lowered. And, and when you talk about health care and climate and um, regulation, you know, I mean, when I think about Occupy Wall Street, for example, I really think about kind of the failure of society to fulfill two basic functions opportunity and accountability, mm -hmm. the intersection there. And particularly at this point, uh, Taryn, what, what your comments uh, brought up for me is this idea that our political economy mm -hmm. is incapable right now of self-correction. Not only are, are, are we hard-pressed to diagnose what's wrong, um, and, you know, we're just two people talking about it, and I, suspect, I know you've talked to others, and I suspect you've actually done a pretty thorough diagnosis at this point. We can talk about prescriptions in a minute. These problems are not that hard to suss out. Right. Uh, but, the, but the system is frozen uh, and unable to self-correct, unable to diagnose, unable to uh, recognize the problem, and, and ergo unable to address it. And a system that can't self-correct is a system that can't survive whether it's a biological system or a political system. And that's the thing that kind of frightens me the most these days. Right. Yeah, I agree. And and I would agree that um, the economists that I've spoken with, I think all, you know, said that they felt that there could be, at least among progressive economists, pretty widespread agreement on what to do, that they could come up with, you know, very specific legislation, very specific programs to address these things, but it's really a matter of political will. And, you know, we're watching it, we're watching it not just here, but in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, everybody's kind of moving towards disaster and unable to um, self-correct. So I guess, I guess that leads us into what we, you know, what we think the prescription would be or how we think we can fix yeah. this thing. <laughs> well, I, I mean, uh, first of all, in Europe, I, uh, I don't disagree when you're talking about the sovereign debt issue they're facing. You've got this, that's a whole other discussion. Basically, they formed, obviously, a monetary union, the 17 countries in the Eurozone, but they didn't form a fiscal union. So right. what that meant is that some countries um, were going to be, uh, for example, Greece, a lot more profligate and reckless in the way they accumulated a, a debt, the way they failed to get anywhere close to collecting the revenues they needed to service that debt. So they became deeply over leveraged, just like, um, you know, Lehman Brothers. And uh, uh, we saw what happened when actually not Lehman Brothers wasn't the biggest bank on the street. Um, you know, they talk about too big to fail. It's really about interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. It was and, and, and obviously Greece is pretty interconnected. <laughs> so, uh, 
Yeah, so, but, but on the other hand, interestingly, in Europe, they've done some things right, not with the crisis, but before the crisis, they've had much less inequality. They have much less, uh, a much less rigid approach to, um, uh, economics, much less of a, 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 particularly public economics, much less of this allegiance to, um, private market self-correcting, uh, uh, you know, any intervention is is is, uh, is just um, you know nudging the invisible hand in the wrong way. All that kind of stuff. They're much less. They've been much less quick to buy into that. And interestingly, uh, in the 1990s, uh, they we used to. In fact, Dean Baker and I uh, uh, went over to uh, Germany once for a conference on on this issue. In the 1990s, American economists, not us, um, were uh, bugging the heck out of the Europeans to be more like we were, to liberalize, to uh, deregulate, to take apart any of their labor market protections, to deunionize. And, you know, a lot of the economists over there were saying, yeah, you know, we got to be more like America. And thankfully, um, many of those folks were ignored. And so they, they have better institutions than right. we do. Less yeah. inequality, you know, more social protection. But they've got this huge problem with sovereign debt. Right. Listen, you wanted to talk about, um, you wanted to talk about uh, what we should do about all this. Right. And okay. kind of, I've been using it as a jumping off point because it just gives us something concrete. Um, that Mike Consul pretty early on had three suggestions for the Occupy Wall Street movement in terms of, um, policy prescriptions. And they were canceling the debt, which we've already talked about a little bit. Uh, uh, holding Wall Street accountable. So having some criminal prosecutions and a financial transaction tax. And oh. then, all right, so those those three things. And then another thing that he had done is with respect to the joblessness issue, he had done a Venn diagram, and he separated out the kind of supply-side folks from the demand-side folks. And on the demand side, the three things that he had were fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, and debt restructuring. So... That's kind of the template I've been using and trying to get an idea of, you know, that it just gives us a starting point. Yeah, sure. Um, well, what, I, I kind of have a different starting point, uh, but I will circle back around to those things. Okay. Because I actually think that it would be smart for us to start not from more granular policies, uh, although I, I totally agree with uh, many of the things Mike says. I was on the phone with Mike earlier today. Oh, so uh, okay. I, I think he's a, uh, just a great thinker on these issues. Um, mm -hmm. But I'd like to talk about uh, starting with a different model. Mm -hmm. uh, economists and um, uh, economists like to think in terms of models. Right. Uh, and models are very – the models are by definition simplistic – reductionist views of reality. Right. But they actually, but, but at a time like this, they actually help you. Um, because if, um, if your model is one that reflects, um, some of the underlying realities, both in terms of, of, uh, realities of what's actually really going on in your economy, including power dynamics, including accountability, including opportunity, but also a model that incorporates some value, um, about a more fair, distribution of, uh, of uh, growth, uh, about a more fair uh, um, uh, taxation of economic activity. That's where the financial transaction tax can come in, about a more uh, responsible uh, set of policies towards debt accumulation. It, you know, it, it, if your model incorporates those things, uh, then I think it, it's actually quite helpful. And the model that we've been subscribing to in this country for not just the last few years, but really since the latter 1970s, mm -hmm. has been what, what you might call rational expectations trickle down supply side economics. Right. Let's call it rational. Let's call it rational trickle down. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, the the rational expectations part. That's a view. Uh, that that's just a, a summary description of a, uh, a a model which argues that. Um, People in an economy have all the information they need to make the best possible decisions, uh, the most efficient decisions, and the de decisions that ultimately 
uh, yield the best economic outcomes for everyone. And uh, it, it, the, the private market through price signals delivers all the information we need to, quote, you know, get it right. And anything the government does just mucks everything up, just just jams the signal. Right. So any regulation jams the signal. Uh, you know, if you start collecting tax revenues, that's jams, you know, jams the signal. Basically, this is this is not just free market thinking, but this is free market on steroids. The argument being that, uh, you know, the argument being that um, that the market polices itself and uh, is the most generates the most efficient outcome. Now that. That's an underlying economics model pervaded by uh, professors in the 70s, 80s, and so on. That ran directly into supply-side economics, uh, which, which was a model that said, if we cut taxes for people at the very top of the income scale, uh, they will have more after-tax income, and they'll use it to generate more productive activity that will trickle down and benefit every, everybody else. Right. And... <laughs> Uh, and once those, the, once that model, that rational expectations trickle down took hold, um, we were off to the races in terms of what I called that shampoo economy, bubble, bust, repeat, redistribute income upwards, as Dean Baker eloquently uh, writes about. Um, it's not like uh, these uh, 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 politicians and, uh, and lobbyists in Washington were really practicing free market economics. I mean, to the contrary, they were trying to stack the deck in their favor every chance they got. Right. So, th- so that's the old model. Um, why don't you react to that for a second, while, uh, and, and then we'll talk about the new model. Okay. Um, I'm not sure react. Uh, Does that make sense to you? It does, absolutely, yeah. I'm very familiar with it. I mean, the stuff that was coming to mind um, was that you're talking about a group of um, the rational expectations – uh, stuff is Bob Lucas and the Freshwater yeah. Economist, etc. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm fairly familiar with the general story. Um, okay. Yeah. So you're familiar with the story, and, and and as that story came into play, you had in Washington, you had Ronald Reagan coming to the microphone saying, you know, the government is the problem, and. Uh, and, 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 and the wedding of, of trickle-down supply side and, and rational expectation um, led us pretty much directly to where we are today. We need a new model. Now, you might have thought that in 2008, when, when now, it, it's actually important, um, to, uh, the Bush years, the George W. Bush years, were very much a, a, a great experiment uh, of how effective that model was. Um, to some extent, Deregulation, which began in the Clinton years, deregulation of, of financial markets, but almost more importantly, uh, a signaling uh, from the Federal Reserve uh, on down to regulators to just go ahead and essentially be asleep at the switch. Um, whether it was creative underwriting or financial innovations, that was all part of the model. Uh, and, you know, it, it really exploded. I mean, this thing just blew up the laboratory uh, in, uh, in, in 2007, 2008. So you might think that that there and then, good night, rational expectations, supply side trickle down, it's over, we're going to start something new. Well, wrong. Uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, just a couple of days ago, a, uh, a hedge fund called MF Global, um, uh, that was, uh, uh, whose chairman was, was former Governor John Corzine, was leveraged up 44 to 1, um, which, you know, that's a leverage ratio, which based, and, and speculating on, um, uh, uh, sovereign debt from Southern Europe. So, uh, you know, essentially, you can. It's, it's a microcosm, but you know, kind of back to where we back to where we started. Even with the implosion of the uh, of the model that I just described. Um, so it's not it's not dead. It's kind of like a zombie. You know, it's really hard to kill. Um, right. So just, just instead of starting out with policies, I'd like to start with a new model, and this new model has to be a hybrid. It has to be a hybrid between a uh, uh, a, a much more uh, a, a model that has much more um, of, of a, a recognition of market failure. Markets fail. Um, the uh, they, they don't always fail. Most of the time, in fact, they work pretty well. But when they fail in a world as interconnected and as complex. As, and as, as globally interconnected and complex as today's, when they fail, 
the what economists call the tail risk, that is a low probability of a very bad thing happening, um, is usually amplified. And we can't operate, uh, we, we simply can't operate, we can't build an economic model that doesn't take that into account. We also need to take to be mindful of inequality, uh, of the extent to which um, the current model has done uh, such a bad job at a fair distribution. And I'm using the word fair, so this is a values-based model as well, uh, a fair distribution of the fruits of growth. It also has to be a model that recognizes the failure of the economy to provide enough jobs. So uh, this is a model that, that this is this is a model that has a, a, a market failure at its core, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, builds uh, builds policies to account for all the things I've just mentioned: regulatory failure, uh, distributional failure, and demand side failure. Right. Okay. So to I, I can back be, I, I, we get. No, go right. ahead. Yeah, we can get more specific. Just to kind of go back a little bit to the, um, you know, in general, the model that you're talking about, you know, it was very, um, you know, what was going on in economics at the time is that these things were very widely accepted, right? I mean, uh, the model that you're talking about was very widely accepted, even across, you know, kind of, um, you know, I guess there was somewhat, there were different schools of thought between freshwater and saltwater economists, but it was, it was thought that, um, really, you know, there's these famous quotes of people saying, you know, I think Bob Lucas, in fact, saying that the problem of, uh, depression prevention has been solved and, uh, you know, the state of macro is good and all of these various. By, by of, the way, one of my, one, one of my, um, best forecasting mechanisms for uh, a recession is when economists start saying we've solved the recession problem. <laughs> that usually means the recession is around the corner. Right. And indeed, I mean, I think that that was, gosh, was it 2003? Which is bizarre because I think 2001 was an incredibly close call, right? I mean, interest rates went to 1%. And so, we're almost in a liquidity trap situation, right? But um, so, I mean, these things were very, you know, and, I, and it's been surprising to me how little many of the economists apparently have been phased by the fact that we have had this enormous meltdown. And essentially, it wasn't just, it wasn't, I mean, their models didn't predict that it could happen. So I would think that it would be, you know, some kind of crisis, but it doesn't appear to be for many of them. Well, I mean, again, it's 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 you're you're, you're restating what I said um, uh, in in a in, in connecting it to the reality that that uh, transpired. It's not that the models. And Brad DeLong, by the way, wrote a very nice piece about this recently. I can't remember where, but he was basically arguing the following. Um, it's not that the models that we had failed, it's that we failed to uh, appreciate the right models. Um, uh, you know, Keynes and then, and then John Hicks's interpretation of Keynes, which is really where he developed the idea of, of um, uh, or, or uh, Keynes developed this idea of a liquidity trap, and Hicks um, talked about precisely the kind of situation we find ourselves in now with interest rates at zero, uh, yet still excess savings uh, throughout uh, the global economy. Um, uh, that was a model that was, you know, circa 1940. So right. uh, it, it had. It's not that they didn't exist. It's that we were we we had forgotten about them. So I'm I'm trying to kind of bring us bring us back there. Um, right. Some so of my uh, is the model if you're you talking. Read, um, is, your, is the model you're talking about then actually new, or is it going to be more of a Keynes-Hicks type model? Um, I think that this. I think that this model, uh, and I, I'm just sort of building this as as I go here. So you know, it's not like I have a uh, fully articulated thing here, but uh, I think that's okay. In fact, I think it's kind of in the spirit of Occupy Wall Street, which, as I've taken it as an outsider looking in, is doing something that I've personally been trying to do for about 25 years, which is to start a conversation about right. these issues. And you and your colleagues have managed to do that in, uh, in about a month, so uh, <laughs> congratulations. Right. Um, I think that there's, uh, I think this is, is uh, certainly Keynesian in spirit, because Keynes is 
Now, really great, in, uh, I think Keynes' key insight was, in fact, that there are times when markets fail, and when they fail, um, the uh, proper thing to do is to intervene, not to sit on your hands and wait for uh, uh, things to fix themselves, because especially if you en- end up in some of these kinds of traps that we find ourselves in now, you could be waiting 10 years, and Japan is a good example of that. But that's not that's not all it is. Um, there is uh, even though um, there was there was obviously um, a significant inequality back then. I mean, the last time income was as concentrated as it is now was in the late 1920s. Right. So it's not like and, and, and Keynes wrote about that. Um, uh, but uh, we've had decades uh, between the 50s, 60s, 70s. We had decades to kind of forget about that because income was much more broadly uh, distributed uh, in those years. And we actually have something new now. So we need a new model. We have something new now. We've actually have, for the first time in, uh, in, as far back as the data go to the 1940s, so something new since the recession is, um, I, I'm sorry, some, since the Great Depression, something new, which is that even in an expansion, in a business cycle expansion, we're not creating enough jobs. Um, if you go back to the Clinton years, we actually created a bunch of jobs, 26, 27 million, something like that. In the Bush years, there was something like 5 million jobs created. I mean, that may sound like a lot, but every single decade, it's not. I mean, every single decade, go back as far as the data, every single decade, you get 20 to 30 percent on jobs. In the Bush years, it was 4 percent. And then we hit the recession and and it's been down 6 percent. So, so that's a, that's, so, so part of, that's why I said part of what we do now has to be mindful. And here, let's get to some specifics already, because people okay. probably w- would like them by now. <laughs> um, that, that's why that's why this we we need to think about um, the role of the government mm-hmm. in job creation um, much more creatively than we've than we've done uh, thus far, uh, because I'm concerned that left to its own devices, uh, the job market will underperform. Uh, I'm not just talking about stimulus here. I'm actually talking about an investment agenda. Mm. If you go back, again, I I try to be somewhat of an economic historian about this. If you go back to every single important economic innovation that led to employment growth, back to the Revolutionary War, by the way, um, uh, the federal government played a role in uh, investing, typically in private industry, whether it was machine tools, are the railroads or transistors or laser technology or, of course, the Internet, um, which has had a major economic, you know, all of which have had huge economic impact. The government was a key first investor. And other advanced economies have recognized this. And their, their economic models include very much a role for government and investment. Clean energy strikes me as an important place to go with that, but it, it, it's not the only place. Um, I still believe that we ought to have uh, manufacturing policies in this country. Um, there are other advanced economies, Germany comes to mind, that uh, has uh, uh, takes that seriously. Um, and I think if, if we uh, uh, frame our thinking uh, in those ways, with public-private partnerships in the interest of uh, helping private industry overcome some of the barriers it faces, uh, uh, we could we could have um, we, we we will have much better results uh, on the employment side. Mm-hmm. I I want to I wanted to just say I do really appreciate the idea of thinking of this as a conversation. You know, I found I started asking um, the various economists I've interviewed. Uh, you know that and and Paul and it was something Paul Krugman had actually mentioned, which is that. The, the kind of, he, he referred to it as the Samuelson synth- synthesis in terms of um, the economic ideas, that there was an inherent instability there. That, yeah, we could go back to those ideas, but, you know, I think he said, in some ways I think we were doomed to repeat this, that there was something inherently unstable about that solution that I think we need, that I hope people will start to rethink about. And Naomi Klein had mentioned something um, which kind of reminded me of this is that she said, you know, I think we have to have the courage to ask questions that we don't necessarily have the answer to. And I feel like a lot of people have avoided a lot of the things that 
they know to be wrong because they don't necessarily know what the alternative is. And that's a habit, I think, that we in general have. But I hear with a lot of people when I will say, well, what do we do about the fact that this is crashing all of the time? Is it going to be enough just to reset up the regulations that we had? There seems to be... Yeah, an... it's not. Right. And so yeah. I very much appreciate, you know, the idea of saying, no, we need something new, and here's what, you know... I mean, we did have a, we did, I think, think we understood how to tackle a lot of these problems, but obviously we're back here and we've, and we've yeah. been, yeah. So anyway, with that, go on. <laughs> so, no, that, that, that's, that's where I'm at too. And I don't, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I am pretty convinced that if we just sort of set things up the way we did before, and we can tweak them in a good way. We can have a financial transaction tax and we can right. try to think about some, some debt forgiveness and, um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe prosecute some criminals. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that, that, that's, that's really important. I'm not dismissing any of that. And, and by the way, given today's politics, any one of those is a hugely heavy lift and would be a great victory. Remember right. where we started, you know, 20 minutes ago, we started talking about the tiny little program to repair some public schools. Uh, right. You know, now we're talking about a totally different way of thinking about the economy. And, and I, I, you know, I try to do both. I sort of have a day job where I'm, I'm thinking about incrementalism. But I think uh, with respect to OWS, it's worth it's worthwhile to, to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the box is characterized by uh, existent models that um, not only uh, – are fairly dismissive of, 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 of market, uh, not only are fairly dismissive of market failure, uh, but to the, to the contrary, you know, at least rhetorically amplify market forces while a bunch of lobbyists are scurrying around, uh, in back trying to, uh, thwart market forces to their own advantage. So I think that, so, so let's talk more, let's talk more about this new, this new model. Okay. So I talked about government investment and I think that's key. Um, but you can't have a government investment if, if government doesn't have um, ample ample revenue, um, and that brings us to you know taxes and fiscal policy. Uh, right now, you know, we're collecting um, something like 15% of GDP in revenue. That's almost an all-time low. Um, we sim and, and a lot of that has to do with the recession, but it also has to do with the fact that. Um, in the Bush years, we, we cut taxes a lot, not just for high-end folks, mostly for them, but also for middle-class people. And the fact is we, we, we can't pursue the model I'm describing on uh, um, an economy that collects 15% of its GDP in revenue. Um, the historical record is closer to 20 21%. But if you think about the aging demographics, if you think about the investment agenda I'm talking about, um, uh, we're, we're, we're going to need to do more uh, on that side. We're also going to need, frankly, a better government. <laughs> um, that's not a particularly radical statement given how dysfunctional things are. You know, but we talked a lot about market failure. There's government failure too. And one of the things that's frustrated me most over the last uh, uh, couple of, uh, over the last decade or so is that the people who believe in rational expectations trickle down, you know, less government, all, all that, all that nonsense. They really have a very important strategic leg up because here's what they can do. They can say government is the problem. Government screws everything up. And when they get elected, they can prove it to you. Uh, right. And, uh, right? <laughs> right. So that was the FEMA, the FEMA Katrina story, right? Exactly. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But it's not, right. look, you don't have to go back to Katrina. Look at the, um, at the debt ceiling debacle. Mm. The debt ceiling debacle is a, is a perfect example of a dysfunctional government, uh, um, unable, you know, creating a crisis, creating a crisis, which might have been embarrassing if the unemployment rate were, you know, four and a half percent, but at nine percent or ten percent, it's beyond, it's, it's tragic. It's, 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 um, uh, you know, dereliction of duty, really. Right. So, so, you know, we've got to deal with government failure. Uh, we've got to amply fund uh, a government that can meet the, the coming challenges we face, whether it's health care and uh, demographic pressures or the need to uh, identify and invest in industries where, where our nation can gain global market share. I mentioned clean energy, but that can't be the only thing, as I, I also mentioned energy, but certainly technology, we've always had uh, – uh, we've always had – um, a, a, a leg up uh, there. So 
Um, th- th- that that's another piece of this puzzle. Well, and do you think within the for the political solution? I mean, I think that um, the most common one you'll hear is getting money out of politics is publicly funded elections, um, mm-hmm. which I think could go a long way. I hope could go a long way. Um, we've taken a crack at finance campaign finance that didn't do anything. Um, but, I mean, if you could meaningfully get money out of politics, one would hope that that would make a huge difference in the kind of, you know, political problems we're, you know, consistently running up against. And, yeah, you mentioned the debt ceiling debacle. And several people I've spoken to said that that was, that was really um, – I don't know, the height of just feeling depressed about the whole thing um, was this summer, and it was for me as well, which is why I've been so glad that there's been this movement um, to finally restore some hope that, you know, maybe something can change. And I think that this movement very much, as much as, you know, people talk about the 99%, 1% in terms of income inequality, I think even more is – the idea that our government's been captured by an e- by an elite by the one percent, and then yeah. it's go on. But they're 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 intimately related. Um, right. I wrote a piece about this. I wrote a piece about this a while ago, and I just the other day ran into this piece by George Packer in the most recent Foreign Affairs, which um, I think would resonate a lot with you and your colleagues uh, mm-hmm. about. Um, this kind of intersection of inequality buying political power. Uh, the, uh, the, these two very much complement each other, and uh, I, I very much uh, agree with you. Um, and I, I think it's uh, going to be, you know, it's, it's obviously very tough to uh, kind of get that, um, it, it, to wrestle that, that collision of these two forces of, of, of increased inequality buying itself much more political access and power, um, especially in the app. You know, there's no countervail. There's, it's hard to see a countervailing force here. Unions have always played that role uh, in, 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 in our nation, but now the union movement is six or seven percent of the private sector work, workforce, much larger, more like 30, 35 in the public sector, but on the run, obviously getting getting beat up uh, pretty bad in, in there. So, so, you know, the, the only thing we have, the only thing we have is bottom up people like yourselves and your colleagues. I, that, that's, that, I, 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 and, and, you know, we have Paul Krugman. <laughs> right. And that, that can get you ahead. And, you know, he can get you, he can get you, a, he can get you a long way all by himself. So, right. you know, we, we have Dean Baker. You know, we have a lot of, we have, we have, we have Mike, uh, Consul. You know, there, there's a lot of great, uh, people who are, I think, seeing behind these veils and what we, what we need to do and what we're actually, what we're doing right here is trying to align some of us, you know, graybeards, um, who've right. been prattling, prattling about this for a long time and right, you know, scratching out our tomes and our models and all that with, right. um, with, with a, a bottom up movement. That's the only way we can prevail. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's exactly um, every almost everybody I've talked to, and it's you know people like you and Larry Mitchell and Dean Baker and you know Doug Henwood and um, Jeff Madrick. Um, everyone has said I've been saying these things for 25 years, and you know, kind of, hmm. and felt really alone. You know. And, well, let me ask you a question. Let, let me ask. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Um, so. You know, in your view, you, as part of this movement, mm-hmm. what what kind of comes next? Um, you know, is this pe- people? Some people say, you know, the winter time's going to come, and then people will go inside, and that will be that. And um, I don't know if you saw this great article by Rich Yesselson that he wrote in Ezra Klein's blog a few weeks ago, talking about he, he's a guy who he's if you didn't read it, I highly recommend it to you and your colleagues. He's a guy who's thought a lot about. Um, He's a labor organizer. He's thought a lot about how movements, how movements grow. Mm-hmm. And you know, he, he, he talked about it. Uh, he, he said it's like exercise. You know, I, I exercise and if I don't exercise every couple days, like it really doesn't work. And I think his point was that 
you know, this is something that people need to be in for the long haul. Right. But tell me how you think about it. Well, and I'll preface it by saying what people of our movement always say, which is that I'm only speaking for myself. Anything that doesn't come out of, like, a general assembly is only an individual opinion. But I'm, you know, there have been, there's been a bit of a debate about how does this movement scale is the words that are used. And um, Doug Hen would use that terminology, and I think it's good terminology. Um, and the issue, is, the issue is how does it, you know, lay down roots, how does it have an organizational structure that's sustainable, that's durable, that doesn't have what I think were the problems of Seattle and some have argued Spain. But, you know, Naomi Klein came and made a very impassioned speech and said, uh, and, and, and before I get to that, I'll say what the problem is, but that, you know, it's an organization that's very committed to horizontalism, but horizontalism maybe has a hard time. How do you, how do you, create organizational structures that are durable and sustainable without doing violence to the kind of horizontalism. And Naomi mm -hmm. Klein came to New York, to Zuccotti Park, and made a very impassioned speech and said, you know, don't fetishize lack of structure to the point that you're not able to build something that is durable. And I, and that's where I come down as well. That I, and I, and I see the movement doing what's necessary to do that. You know, like they've now created spokes council models and they're now starting to have those conversations in terms of how do you create something that is durable and sustainable. And of course you want to maintain horizontalism to the extent possible, but I'm not of the view that, you know, the park is the goal. I, I have much higher, I have higher goals and higher aspirations. I want to see something, you know, I'm, you know, and again, I'll borrow from Naomi Klein. She said, I want to win. And, and I feel like we have to win. I feel like the stakes are very high. Um, so what is, what is, what does winning look like? How, 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 right. how, how do you, how do you think about that? Well, I, you know, I mean, I'd like to see us make a change, make, changes in the government so that it's responsive again to the 99% and that we're able to govern and, and you know, save our environment for one. I mean, that's what I, yeah. Yeah. So that's okay. what I, so, yeah. So that, 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 that's what I was, that, I, I, I'm very happy to hear you say that because yeah. um, you, you went right to um, politics. Right. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think that I think that is, you know, again, I'm not, I'm definitely not speaking <laughs> uh, for the movement. I'm not, I'm not right. part of it. Uh, right. But I do, I do think that what I'm describing, what I'm envisioning, mm -hmm. a completely different, well, a, 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 a very different economic model, one that understands markets will fail and plans accordingly fail in terms of distribution, fail in terms of employment, fail in terms of regulation, uh, uh, and, um, and, and plan, and plans accordingly. That's going to take, um, a lot of political work. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, I, I want to be clear about this just going back a minute. It doesn't mean that, um, you want to disband, um, you know, capitalism or, or the insights of even a, someone who's viewed as a, uh, you know, very much the opposite of Keynes, um, uh, the, the economist Hayek, who, who recognized the coordination and the information embedded in, in prices and price signals. And all of that's really important, but it's all very distorted right now because of all the market um, distortions that we've experienced. I would, the price of risk is a great example, hugely distorted. Uh, as as these bubbles continue to inflate, so something is fundamentally wrong in the basic system, and that needs to change. And I think the route to change is through politics. Um, I'm uh, again just, and I sh we should close out here just because I'm I'm running right. out of gas. But right. um, but I I, th I think I think the I think the way forward um, is going to be trying to f is going to be for the for for your movement and for people who are thinking outside the box uh, to align and, and work together uh, to frame this, this new model to find political representatives who will help us uh, reify it and, um, you know, see what happens. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, my and my hope, and and this, I think, actually, you know, there's been other debates. There was one that Doug Henwood was involved, the Jacobin Magazine did, where they talked about these same issues. And this is controversial. You know, what we're talking about, I think, is a uh -huh. fairly controversial thing within the movement for the reasons that I discussed earlier. But, you know, and I recently wrote something where, you know, I said that my hope is that, you know, um, there, Kevin Drum did some work relying pretty heavily on um, political scientists, Hacker and Pearson's winner take all politics, and there's oh, a, yeah. mm -hmm. and there's a there's a basic story which is that sometime in the late '60s the left made a move away from uh, you know bread and butter uh, economics issues and labor issues and towards a kind of post materialism, and I think and and at great cost. I mean that's kind of I think what's taken us to where we are now, where we have you know, labor unions have been decimated and we have income inequality at all time highs. But we really did make progress on social and cultural issues. And now that there is a turn back towards economic issues, my hope is that is that the 99% can't be divided along the kind of cultural lines, that that work that was done is not for nothing in that sense, that it's not so mm -hmm. easy to, you know, divide us with wedge issues and those types of things. But of course, there's a lot of problems with the current political alignments. And so I think that, that I mean, I think that there's some political realignment that's needed. I'm not against politics, but the, you know, Democrats have been some of the worst offenders in terms of mm -hmm. deregulation and these types of things. So that would be my yeah. thoughts on it. So, all right. Well, you know, let's let's uh, let's continue <laughs> this conversation. Uh, it actually would be good for you to do one of these with Jacob Hacker if you haven't already. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the authors of that. He, he's he's a he's a colleague who has uh, I think a lot of uh, important things to say in precisely the space you, you ended up in, uh, where not just Republican but Democrat slash Republican politics went wrong. Obviously, money is a huge a huge part of it. So uh, uh, that, that's got to be part of the uh, uh, diagnosis and prescription as well. Well, thank you. This has been really great. I've enjoyed it so much, and I think you're doing great work. And so keep trying to do what you can to save the country. <laughs> you too. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.